This final blossoming after those kissing dissonances. And this elegant hint of a minuet choreography more than gesture even, just hint. Short long. Short long. Precisely so. Dissonant consonances. Since it's very neoclassical or neo baroque, loosely so for Ravel. His teacher was Fauré, after all, who was into the timeless classicism of the ancient music uh, from the modes of the Greeks to the Gregorians. So he was at a good school to be in temporal, extra temporal. So it's not really a neoclassical, which sometimes in Stravinsky was considered in the 30s as a little bit of a, a deviant thing, or perhaps even um, a little bit of a pasticcio, or perhaps an homage, but always a bit on the second degree of importance, not sincere music. When here it is. So when he has the hemiola to embrace two bars over the kissing dissonances. So it will be one and two and three. Anticipation, two, three. And then the circle of fifths in the bass. Model um, perfect cadence. I don't think if it's possible to be called perfect cadence, but it's not with the leading tone. It's a 5 1 in the descending minor, so obviously it's model, and probably then that couldn't be considered fully as a functional motion. It's more imitative of some of the dances of Gervaise. Uh, which uh, Poulenc uh, transcribed in his Suite Française. not, but uh, re-enchantment of the French harpsichord uh, glorious school before the French Revolution, after which there was so much civil war, so many heads disappeared, literally, from their bodies. Generations were lost, continuity was interrupted, more than only bodies. Terrible uh, connection of thoughts. But nevertheless, um, these... Uh, composers at the end of the 19th century, early 20th, in France felt necessary to write homage to Rameau as book one of Debussy's image is representing not even a quote of a pasticcio, literally just an, an, an impression of an emotion of a piece by Rameau. 
which uh, score was not published in Debussy's time, way after a Corto student brought it to the States and it was published, uh, well, recently, so to say, relatively in the last uh, few decades. Nevertheless, in the Sarabande, under that title, in the Suite pour le Piano, it's harmonized with minus nine sevenths, rather than half diminished. playing a wrong harmony, it could happen, but in this case, willingly, I was playing the original first, first row of that piece before he wrote it in 1901, I think, a part of this ensemble called Suite pour le Piano, as a Saravante. Ravel also wrote a minuet other than in the 
tempo diminuet in the sonatin, in the, his homage, as Debussy did to Rameau, uh, Ravel to Couperin, and it's called Tombeau de Couperin. Uh, well, it's an homage, that's why they used to call it Tombeau, it's uh, the grave of Couperin. And uh, he did, uh, did write a suite of ancient dances, but in his modern style. And one of them is the minuet. <laughs> So, uh, nostalgia through some of the minor triads in a more minor mode. Yeah, it is not um, per se an effect. It's more like a state of being. And he happens to have dedicated each of the movements of that until the Toccata at the end for each of his um, camarades who died in World War I uh, around him in his uh, platoon. So, uh, he connected Tombeau also in that sense as a homage to his fallen friends and um, at the same time uh, perhaps searching in a, a bit nationalistic feeling like Debussy had more than Ravel perhaps or equally differently. Uh, the desire to establish the grandness of France in its glorious past. And here it's a... Uh, In the Tombeau de Couperin, Ravel doesn't call it menuet, it's simply, but mouvement de menuet, tempo de minuet, in the mood of a tempo of space, in the steps of a minuet. And so you have lots of the short long, short long, and then long short. But when you do put several of them, it becomes camiola inevitably. But here, long short. the steps of the choreography, of Baroque or neo-Baroque, of the uh, gentle and um, smooth, uh, reverent uh, gestures that were done during the dancing uh, with those large dresses, Marie Antoinette-like. say dissonant kisses in the major second and then um, minor ninth minor second since they pass quickly softly and underground or underlined under the mel melody line in that sense it's important to have forky fingers with straight fingers knuckle to tip, which represents a, an equal touching at the same time in precise immediacy, so that you don't lose the chance to hear them. Very often, if the thumb being horizontal, the second being bent a little bit shorter than the third, which is longer, so it's bent longer, then you have black and white keys, all kinds of factors that 
contribute with a more macaroni soft fingers which would caress the keys to have a rambunctious key in the action that responds less well to this minimal amount of grammage that you put weight on in the tips of the cushions of the fingers deep in the keys less deep to create that sense of floating fluffiness and then you have holes, Swiss cheese like uh, the beautiful um, richness which you could hear in loud voice slowly that you have the opportunity of in almost like an brassy orchestration way to receive plentifully in your ears and soul and heart but it's so much like harp or chord or combination of delicate vulnerable sounds um, length of which is um, not too long but just at, arrives at fruition at the moment of the suspension the beauty of and, and, and in, 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 uh, intricate complexity of contrapoint by lutenists where you hear so many things that if you just <coughs> clear your throat you already covered but if you attentive and listen you manage to hear piano no pianissimo nevertheless voice with the upper stem and if you play the unicorda, on some pianos it's more... It stifles too much. But the color is important too. But the color doesn't determine the melody. It just creates a set of ambiance, atmosphere. It could be any chord. and you have the light of the sun setting um, contours and that's what I see and that doesn't work with some of the unicorda settings on some of the pianos where it takes too much of the harmonics brightness and juice of the sound and it yes makes it softer and rounder but doesn't make it uh, projecting the length uh, and and just a simple like child singing um, melody line without vibrato un uninvolved with emotion other than just the beauty of the interval itself being the emotion the emotional uh, injection of expression that we would put into that leap because then it's all of a sudden too much it lacks that elegance of the hint pizzicato in the left hand is a bit of an effect but most of the time uh, we can figure out the tempo by the fact that it's supposed to be tempoed movement as if all of us know what the tempo movement of a minuet is as if we've danced it let less um, attended a ball that had it other than reconstitutions obviously in films or in theater plays and there are choreographers who are specialists in that and one can document oneself and more than ever nowadays uh, available uh, materials, uh, audiovisual ones are available but in to return to the touch quality, tempo, articulation, sound, pedal, halo um, but not overwhelming 
I think you have to adapt to each acoustic and keep your ears clean from the experience of oh I would like it this way or that way just adapt it to the way it, it, it comes every time each piano will sing it with a different voice and each acoustic will dress it in a different halo and then if you feel like it's too dry because your ears are connected to your body compared to what you project in the hall but that you don't have their ears separate from the piano you might feel like you have to add more pedal is an idea more than an uh, ultimatum like here is not piano is wrong because it could be pianissimo it could be mezzo piano it's compelling you oh what how is the short long this lombardic movement tossing it from the first beat short up to the second beat and like the expected who would know before we start in the rest um, let's say a beat that is not uh, three one three one but it's one two one two so let's try pianissimo let's try pianissimo and a little bit more andante than andante morto Adagio pianissimo, which would be, I think, the extreme of the stretch and the softness. Yeah, a little bit more voiced. Two, three. Andante and a little less pianissimo, just piano andante. And if I want it more um, material, much of a fact ish, it could be a little bit more, uh, more, more, uh, yeah, more filled with harmonies. room. With a gentle goodness smile and openness and upliftness of the beat rather and then It's pianissimo, so that should be softer than opening. Then the hairpin. So much too early to be noted that the opening two lines are repeated, and I think they should be repeated equal, so that when the third line comes after the first four in fact lines. It comes like from a distant place and then open. Because that hairpin number two, Debussy, but Ravel also does hear um, echo cell, repeating its own melodic, uh, motivic development. Pianissimo with descending thirds with minor sixth, the real minor, E flat minor, and with ascending minor in descending motion in parallel thirds, but highlighted this way instead of which have been, would have been if both of the thirds parts were not highlighted by this. Major, bottom, minor, halfway, hybrid, and landing on the minor a tri 
try it, even if with the 9-8 appoggiatura, more than the suspension in this case. It creates the sense of diminuendo from mezzo piano to pianissimo in two bars. <laughs> compared to um, piano and pianissimo and mezzo piano pianissimo and then here triple pianissimo with the middle voice out on the hour. Four by four bars, it's constructed by sixteen bars. Forte, sorry for this wrong note, fortissimo. That's an interesting wrong note. Anyway, at the end of this first of two pages, we reach the fortissimo, that should be the climax. So for an elegant, soft, dynamically um, not too dramatic movement and just a middle movement between two faster movements. <laughs> continuous motion, the first and the third, in the middle movement. This kind of moment of welcome sunshine, uh, not with too much busyness. Here uh, reaches a moment of unexpected dynamic range from triple pianissimo in eight bars, which is supposed to be... Reaching. to double forte in yeah eight bars is what I thought um, not that I count them but the proportions seem very balanced but still very violent to start from so far down as if it's magical. But mostly it's magical because he knows how to use the spectrum of the ranges. So you hear three things at the same time that don't um, collide or cancel, nor um, heavy, nor stuffed, um, just what it is. Pianissimo piano with expressively brought out the Which they played mostly 
in these days than in France with Erard and Gavos, where pianos, unlike the Steinways, which especially for the player, had very little um, um, dampers in the top registers, so it was naturally harping, so to say, you would do. Or, it's kind of um, aquatic resonant sounds uh, were very natural, like uh, the sound of a harp. And on the modern pianos, like the Steinways, where we have dampers on each that cut the sound, even if there's some natural resonance, even in a dry acoustic like this room, then the abundance of pedal recompensates that, a la that lack of natural resonance, which was even um, without putting the down foot, uh, down to putting the pedal, the right pedal, the top sounded any resonant, very resonant, which explains the Ravel's um, je do. Uh, it well, doesn't explain je do, but it, um, it, it contributes to um, notice how obvious it is to be played on a French piano of the day. Or Debussy, the image, or any of them. Those kind of things. And here it's a move for the bells. sounds that resonate just by the emanation of the sound, just like almost um, when you have fog after rain, after the heat, and you obtain this kind of uh, yeah, um, emanations of resonances of the sound. Nothing is real, nothing is uh, realistic like that. Fortissimo, it's not heavy, it should be... Sorry for the note. Not also, but not heavy. Rachmaninoff or some Tchaikovsky, but... Uh, the mode is soft. to do and Debussy almost never is double negation in case you would make a ritenuto in the recaps of bridge well don't that's what he writes a tempo sans ralentir as if he assumes that you will musically chromatically rising to the A flat triad D flat triad with the A flat fifth I meant with the chromatic third and seventh start with a recap of the opening with a slightly different harmonization but he marks it sans ralentir just because you would perhaps do it <laughs> in Debussy um, not so often but in Beethoven we have some kind of anti-intuitive moments like at the end of 109 first movement you would feel like more fading the sound he has a crescendo and then subito piano for the chord. So instead of disappearing, you augment. So you have to make it your own understanding, not only because it's written, it has to become part of your agogic in your syntax of Beethovenism. And in here you have a, a tempo, crescendo, and no slowdown is written. unnoticed without making it a flag and okay now we restart just let it run uh, with the roll of eighth notes in the left hand And the 
before the ending, I would like to remind myself, as well as I do my students, Ravel himself had a sort of allergy to interpretation as such, a little less of his music. He would like to say often that uh, I was told, one does not make interpretations of my music, one plays my music as such. As if everything is in it, included the interpretation, which is unfortunately in the eye of the beholder could be, there are variants, and that is the richness of it. Imagine if not, we'd be just all repeating each other only. Not always, sometimes, and it's nothing wrong. After all, it's a common treasure for all of us to play when we arrive on the level that we can afford it, and then all of a sudden we are given the gift of it, and we have to share it. And if it's uh, reminiscent of the way others do it, it's nothing to do. It's like oh, a composer who writes a section of a piece that reminds somebody else's piece. Unless it's willingly made as a quotation, perhaps almost ironic, it's different. But not the case. Here in the interpretation, it's more about finding the right tone, not an exaggeration, but still the gestural presentation of elements, how you merge into the traffic from this section to the other. There is always this variable that will remain your signature as a performer, perhaps exaggerated in a moment of intense emotion in one concert, and perhaps more, let's say, yeah, intellectualized and, and organized in a recording session where you're just alone with the score without the, I call it sometimes the cushion of the silence of the withheld breaths of the audience members, which creates the density of the silence, which in the rehearsal room we don't even have. The fact that people refrain from breathing loud in order to hear this moment, compared to the dead silence where there is nothing but just emptiness of the space and not humans holding their breath to hear it and participate in this beautiful return to the theme even if they're not aware of it as such, but they feel it through their psyche and their mood and their, they, they captivated, are captivated by the atmosphere that the music creates to the psyche and imaginary daydreaming. So we are responsible of interpretation, even if the composer in this case was suspicious of the exaggerations of most of the performance of his day, who would take so much more liberties, which I think triggered his allergy to interpretation as such. But today I think we are more respectful to the point to which we mostly recite than narrate, but I rather think, think it's possible to narrate uh, with a loving intelligence of the piece without to feel a traitor or betrayer of the musical thought of the composer. <laughs> the knowledge of the composer's intention. We just own a temporary fleeing moment, the emotion that is created by the combination of resonant sounds, rhythms, and the elegance of the placement of, their, of those elements, and share it with our audience. And if that picks up on the moment, it becomes this vulnerably strong, paradoxically in a way, communion uh, between uh, audience and performer uh, around the music um, they came to hear. Even if they didn't come for that reason in the first place, some came for the performer, some came for the piece, some came for comparison and so on and so forth. But it exists and it's a, at the moment it's more like an ephemeral intensity and then it dissipates itself after like just an unforgettable memory. <laughs> And if it went wrong, it stays like a stain. Oh, I should have done it better. But that's for the performer point of view, not for the audience. Often they prefer it, even imperfect. And you would expect in this elegant two pages, um, uh, small size, concise, in, but intelligently filled with just not too much of what is necessary, so you can't, the contents is there just oh, to allow you to breathe and smell and then inhale and then imagine your imaginary uh, storytelling. And I think that it could have been something of the...
doesn't, obviously, because uh, all the alternative versions are terrible, even if they're inspired and respectful. But I would have imagined something uh, either top or bottom, but soft. Instead of this, he has this rising, blossoming, but large, très long, ralentendo. It's all of a sudden, he should have almost written it instead of any more 3-8 in 3-4, but it's almost as if when you have a 3-8 that is très long, instead of playing one, two, one, two, in the original tempo, the codetta would be... Menomoso would have been. But if it's molto menomoso, very slow, très long, it's an adagio. and powerful and grand you will play the piano instruments sound decays so therefore the slower it is the more di softer you finish when he indicates forte diminuendo but without how far the diminuendo goes so he would like to keep it resonant <laughs> while the top shines and sort of like stays as if unnaturally continuing to resonate for eternity. I do very often, I seek to imagine, hint to hope, uh, Im imagine to suggest chimiolas everywhere. Perhaps they are only hinted and some of them are uh, meaningful as they are um, underground water um, sort of um, currents that brings us to the next shores in a more elegant uh, way even if it's a slow tempo. And sometimes perhaps it's too much to imagine them everywhere, even if they are plausibly there. Sometimes it's just short, long, long, short. Again, in the eye of the beholder. The gift that keeps on giving. And it gives always such an amazing new dimension to the meaning music playing. Because you evoke a dance, you evoke an aria, you evoke a past, um, but also a present. And um, the fact that a composer uh, pays homage to a past music connects you to this other music as well. I find it fascinating to teach it, to have known it since my childhood, and to see it uh, grow uh, and blossom like through seasons. It's a very tender feeling, I must say. And when the audience is there to share it, even if they don't know the piece, um, they connect with uh, the performer. And all of a sudden, even the stage fright of some of the students, I understand, is a level of perhaps reserve. Um, attention that is driven on them rather than through them on the piece and they need to find a way to like chameleons expect to accept the place in order to give uh, focused on the piece but also accepting to share as a listener plus not just a performer who would do the uh, 
task of the uh, industry of making it. Of course, the piano, unfortunately, is not an instrument that touches the sound directly physically. It's all a mental um, um, projection. Uh, for instance, in another of the most beautiful Ravel pieces uh, that comes to mind among many, the vibrations of the vibrato the string the string I don't touch the string itself like violinists would do I don't feel it through my body the air <coughs> and the singing that projects I'm not an instrument where the playing is its own industry of making um, in, involves a gesture and therefore a focused organization of the fact of playing the music that is um, physically involved in the production of it and there are certain aspects for the oboe, the flute, the reed, the bassoon, the, um, anything that you play other than piano and perhaps organ to a certain extent um, are not instruments where you feel the vibration of the sound itself you imagine it, you, you project it, it's more of an intellectual projection and I think in that sense, the pianist is a little bit more prone to, I guess, uh, for the students I have observed so many, um, jet lag, uh, <laughs> like um, a little bit of vertigo also, like uh, most of the time it's a um, change of the um, hormonal, if not at least the, um, um, the body sensation, uh, the... Um, uh, the bloodstream um, irrigation of the endings um, often like uh, when animal uh, scare comes to us we withhold breathing and everything and so because it's, it, it is a sense of fear basically not to disappoint oneself, the audience, the piece but because one is observed how one plays and the playing of it can be totally abandoned freedom of the body to daydream and sometimes act a little bit one's uh, comfort zone even if it's not the case completely because you have to control the articulation, the phrasing, the fingers, the position certain things of course you do naturally automatically or you can be very focused to the audience. In other words, there are postures that are a little bit more um, personal to one or another performer that could distract even from the music itself. But there is an inevitable dimension of seduction in the best sense of the word to the audience when you play for others or with others to others. And because you have to play when you're alone mostly from memory and therefore um, some of the memory slips can occur, uh, the knowledge of the harmonic progressions in a reduction keyboard harmony helps a lot. But not everybody has it in full time as a parallel stream to the music itself, like in parallel channel. And then uh, if uh, a finger <coughs> trips or a note stands out louder than you wish to have controlled it better because all of a sudden you are betrayed by the action or your lack of preparation to uh, secure by the grip of the positioning of the um, palm how you're going to um, espouse each of the different um, dispositions of the topography it's almost like a sculptor with um, malleable elements that you prepare to shape each um, of the Harmonies. That's probably more close to the industry of the playing of the other instruments. But nevertheless, it remains <coughs> a projection 
rather than in a position of reaction to the instrument itself. Um, so that point's too late because we cannot act as a uh, <laughs> crescendo or vibrato on the note. Obviously. We always have to start with the sound and then we have to deal with that level of dropping by the time we have to connect to the next note. the breathing is different when you play in front of others because you withhold a lot of your um, impulse um, in flux and then you don't de exhale as much um, a bit like um, like a fearing animal basically um, that's kind of um, at the core of it and the fact that also um, you might imagine that people know what you do and uh, if you play for people who just accept the music but don't know the piece, you feel more free. Free narration, as I like to say, yes. And repeat myself often, like teachers do too. <laughs> Another thing with singing I thought I won't do when I teach, but I do too. Uh, it is true, the um, syllabic recitation compared to the free narration, and where the interpretation becomes the in fact, essence of one's being as a performer. And um, uh, it translates um, what you have received from the piece and the fear of being um, uh, betrayed by oneself physically in terms of the perfection of the cleanness of the nose, but also um, the lack of concentration. All of a sudden, sometimes one, one has um, a stage right, one forgets where one is in terms of in the piece. And that's why the um, keyboard harmony progression of the chords helps. So if you get slightly distracted by something that went wrong, from a cough in the audience to a wrong note that pulled out and you're playing and you're surprised even you, <clears throat> you look at it and you go like, where am I? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, that sense of loss of concentration focus can happen to all, especially um, because the um, ear hears what you play, but also in anticipation, the inner ear is connected quickly to the neurons and the fingertips. So like when you side treat and you right now, right away figure it out, often the fingers figure out um, through the cognitive memory the patterns of the... And so the fingers sort of create their own memory. <clears throat> And uh, then it's like walking the dog in the street, you just follow the leash uh, and all of a sudden you just watch them play until one of the fingers trips or two or something or a shifting, especially if it's a bass note that you miss and all of a sudden the harmony doesn't sound like it's supposed to be and often in the left hand it happens when the harmonies are more or less in the left hand if the melody is in the right hand. Well, of course, not all the time. So in, in, in many aspects, um, uh, performing in concert is taking the risk to um, take it from the tabula rasa, from the moment of um, just cleaning, uh, reset, reset the tables and just start all at once. And um, nothing what you just did matters, it's what you're going to do that matters. So you project yourself like a conductor. <laughs> teacher, Mademoiselle Boulanger, used to say, if you take a wrong tempo when you start, and that happens often, keep it, <clears throat> make sense of it, <clears throat> make sense of the unexpected on the stage. And in a way, by practicing and repeating many times a section or groups of sections of the piece, Pianists uh, should be able to, um, in fact, not practice to play like they practiced ultimately on stage in a sort of a like perfect trajectory, um, unaffected by the fact of playing for others, which is emotionally something that inevitably has to be taken into account, but to be able um, in an immediacy on the spot to adapt to the unexpected production of the sound that one started doing in the tempo, the sound or the quality, whatever it is. And for instance, when you start, let's say, too slowly, you cannot just start rushing to adapt it. Or you 
tempo you cannot change next bar next tempo so therefore you have to hear it inside yourself before even you start and once you start just follow that flow on which you have anticipated your uh, phrasing direction we know the second beat is meaningful we have to go towards it and the first beat is light but is um, giving that uh, sense of um, um, projecting yourself upwards like the downbeat is uplifting <laughs> yes the uplifting downbeat <laughs> progression if you, if you know it by the skeleton of the harmonic um, um, not uh, just analysis on paper but literally by um, reduction on four parts or three parts of the harmonic progression you know where you go constantly I think it's important it's as important as to practice to play it even or to play it with a soft tone or to breathe and whatever happens when you open it you accept it you don't fight it like you don't fight the fact of being on stage for those who have stage fright in that sense that they don't belong there or the attention or the Yes, I like to say, again repeating myself, the withheld air, um, sorry, um, the breath of the audience is an intense silence which is expecting from you. And sometimes that sense of expectation is what makes some of the stage fright more, um, more so. But if you can stay in a bubble and ignore the existence of the audience, it doesn't really function to me at least. I think you have to be with the audience. Of course, if you try to <coughs> seduce the audience too much, then it becomes... And the difficulty is to find the right tone, the right voice, the right... Um, not detached, nor uh, demonstratively involved, of course, some people are distracted in the audience or the performers themselves if their face reflects the difference of harmony change, like I'm smiling to thank you, the chord. It's cheesy even to mention it. Of course, I can force myself to have an uh, impossible face in order not to influence the audience by my face. After all, it's the tip of my fingers. I have to produce the resonant quality, the dissonant um, kisses as I like to call for the minor seconds so if I do it in a very austere presentation body torso not moving face without any expression and just focus all the attention on the tips focused and concentrated on their inner voice that guides them forward. The invisible conductor conducting inside us, uh, inviting us by the upbeat to the next. Sometimes we are distracted by the movement of the um, um, hammers that are visible on the grand piano compared to the upright. Uh, sometimes we are distracted by the mirroring of our fingers in the <coughs> um, lid. 
um, in other words, many things can distract us because our quality of hearing is heightened by the fact that we are on the spot, whether it be audition, jury, exam, or just, just a concert in the best sense of the word, without judgment, meaning other than expecting to receive an appreciation for the narration. Um, but when you play and you can um, lose focus, sometimes you close your eyes to interiorize more and hear the sounds. And say, can I play it softer with the tip of the fingers touching the edge of the keys? And sometimes by doing so, I hear better. I enhance my hearing. to do that with um, a piece that would have a lot of leaps <laughs> because inevitably you'll miss them unless you do the braille system where you touch the keys just distracted by what you see. Most of the time the visual memory allows you to visualize the score passing in front of your eyes or sometimes um, subconscious memories of moments, sections where you learned the piece and it comes back to you just the day you discovered that section because sometimes it's embedded in the subconscious, a bit like you don't remember after you wake up some of your dreams or all of your dreams but then some element in the day that happened uh, all of a sudden gives you a flashback to a section of that dream and it becomes as real as if you were really in the reality and the dream being the reality and the daydream and so forth. And I think that when you perform, you allow for all this to happen because you cannot contribute while well, you try to control not the fact of how you will play, think, hear the piece, but allow that the piece will reveal itself will, in the space of the acoustic of the day of the moment in the way it will. And so instead of fighting it to try to fit it to how you practiced it in some kind of perhaps a more... Um, focused to, um, to the detail way, you should just let it speak and watch it happen and be always by the inner count ahead of the beat so you're always preparing for the next position if you need to lift the fingers um, there are the rest at the moment of get go or play the note in the key surrender to the um, temptation when it's soft and tender like this movement in some of these sections naturally um, to start caressing the keys because that is uh, really playing with uh, serendipity you don't know what's going to happen which key will be heavier than the others and then you'll be betrayed especially in soft sections where it will be difficult to cover there's nothing to cover uh, no pedal can help nothing uh, no gesture, no, no, no gesturing or posturing. So you have to be um, always playing with the tip of the fingers going as fast as possible the depth deep in the key, whatever the depth of the action of the instrument you play. So that if that is the case, just by the sheer speed of the drop from the knuckle to the tip, without more than the wrist which should be free, but not the forearm pushing in order to play mezzo forte and, four for, and, and louder, for, obviously. Um, that, you're, um, that you feel that you're in the depth of the touch with the intensity of the close-up. Especially for the legato. And I think that it 
also helps a lot uh, for the stage fright to be in most possible constant contact with the keys. After all, as if we don't have a physical direct projection to the or touching the string or the vibration of the sound that we produce on the piano, at least uh, the fact is is that we project with we, we project ourselves through the key and the action that touches the hammer that hits the strings, etc., and the resonance. And I think we create a sense of imaginary, um, perhaps over legato, and in, in overstaying of some of the notes if it's very legato and you feel the intensity passing from knuckle to knuckle as if you have a bow inside the, the um, palm of the hands, imaginary, like shaping, sculpting. Um, yeah. I think this physical um, connection. <laughs> Constancy, of course, you have to breathe the wrist meaning. If not, you'll be stuck in a tension position for the wrist, for the tip of the finger. It should be always the, the arms not stuck to the trunk in order to be always flexible to not to a row, but uh, if needed. If most of the time, just maintain. Uh, your natural disp disposition towards the keyboard. Uh, all these elements are elements of reassurance that if you play deep in the keys, on the edge of the keys when it's soft, and you feel the tips of the cushion of the fingers, some keys might not respond perfectly, but you have a direction of a line. It's not just one note at a time. It's not a sound at a time. It's a sentence at a time. phrase and your audience in the narration with and don't get overwhelmed with the details that didn't work out on the spot like because it's like driving and watching only the rear view mirror to see what is behind me and you have to do that while you still project yourself ahead to see what you're gonna do in the next curve etc and so what I'm trying to say is that we need to accept that the unex unexpected will happen if it does and it most likely do does and it's not always in the section we expect. Uh, therefore, we have to be not acting surprised, angry, upset, but why after I practiced it so much and all that? Because it's all distracting you from the only thing that matters is tell the story, even if you trip on the word, but continue in your line. Make sense. And that, that will bring you to the next line. And ultimately, is the meaning that you give to it. Of course, you will dress it in the best color you can, in the best tempo you can, and sometimes not the one you chose or wished or happened. But that is part of the fact of taking the risk to play in public. But it's a calculated risk because you practiced in order to expect and accept the unexpected that will happen on stage and make it not as if faking that you you imagined it, but I think it happens very quickly in an unexplainable way between you reacting to what you produced and knowing where you want to bring the phrase or the line or the sounds and the pedal and everything. So I think even if there are flotation moments where you're slightly not focused on it because you're just adapting to the situation on the stage, okay, you can have a little bit of a less adherence of like a s synchronization between your brain and your fingers but not for too long hopefully <laughs> and if ever the worst comes that you don't know where you are you can always restart at the section and then hope to just let it go through if you're not holding back so much your um, breathing not to mention less because of the irrigation of the brain and just um, if you connect to the imaginary um, line that you have in your mind, either the visualization of the score, either of where you learned it, or just uh, um, perhaps odors, smells, atmospheres um, that are connected to some harmonic progressions, just let the piece not distract you by its beauty, uh, like Ulysses passing in front of the sirens asking to be waxed in his ears and locked, 
uh, around the pole of the boat, so he doesn't surrender to the seduction, but rather accept the seduction of the peace, not trying to seduce only the audience, but to a certain extent you do, because you're honestly connected to the peace. In that case, anything you do, the smile to it, is not affected or circus-like, and if you do, or sad face if you think, it's just you become part of the making of the piece. So you allow to be the vibrating membrane of the music, or of the meaning of the music through you. And at that point, the technique for the articulation is the uh, cognitive memory, and it comes in the muscular memory from the practiced uh, holden pokes and all. Um, and dotted rhythms, and then the rest is just happening. And most of the time we are unsatisfied as performers because we only remember the things that didn't work out as we wished, or we hoped, or we expected, or angry at having made mistakes in places we've never made mistakes. In other words, may, uh, life in its beautiful imperfection, and uh, our vulnerable um, hope, but the strength as well, not to be vulnerable, but expect accepting it. While the audience in general, not only by kindness, but in truth, is there to receive something. And I think that there is a fair exchange. Even if uh, in the audience you have people who know the piece, well, in that case, you sort of cooked. You cannot fake that you didn't miss something. So they didn't speak. And, but I think they should blame only themselves if they consider it as a decision-making for the quality of the playing. I still believe that the sincerity of the understanding, the projection of the playing, the integrity of the musicianship, the practice technique, and the accepting of the unexpected, all together um, by holding a certain constant connection of the keys with the tip of the fingers, should help to, uh, by multiple performances, create a certain sense of um, comfort zone with the piece performance, which reveals itself differently every time. But at the, at, at the end of the day, it's better this way than if it reveals itself constantly the same way, because then you'll just repeat yourself. And that is not right. It's not even um, meaningful. What is meaningful is to revisit it every time. It takes a few revisitations. Thank you.